It's a great honor to introduce our next speaker to the gathering, Professor, Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery, Raja Muttaya Dental College and Hospital, Annamla University, Dr. Tangavelu, to give his presentation. Thank you all a very good morning. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizing principles of IMS for inviting me to give this, uh, to share my experience on this surgery address you in this uh, great morning. May I know how, how many of you are postgraduate students? Any postgraduate from oral surgery? Rest of them are undergraduates, dental, medical, fine. So this podium is not new to me because I was sharing my experience with some of the uh, staff members of PIMS. Uh, we conducted a conference called as ITAC uh, in International uh, Trauma Critical Society in 2004 and I was only one of the organizing secretary because we didn't have an auditorium of 400 capacity inside the town. We brought the conference in PIMS and I was nowhere connected to PIMS by a, I organized the conference in PIMS in the same auditorium that was in 2004 with all great help of then people who are working here as directors and deans and medical superintendent. So this podium is uh, not a very new podium for me to stand before I was here for three, four days conducting the workshop and conferences in the ITAX uh, society. So I would like to remember my mentor, Dr. Beach, those, who, those of you who don't know, this gentleman is one of the uh, senior oral surgeon who has promoted oral surgery in this part of the country, especially Tamil Nadu, and he was a mentor for so many students, and I belong to his school of thought. And uh, he is Dr. P. Srinivasan. And, uh, when, when we talk about orthognathic surgery, those days when we were postgraduate students, there was not much of orthognathic surgery which was done. And all what surgeries and uh, distraction or whatever has been done was only abroad and we used to learn from people coming from abroad. And these two people managed to point out, especially Varghese Manisar and Dr. Noyak were two gentlemen in oral maxillofacial surgery. Orthognathic procedures to everybody and they conducted a, a, a workshop called as FACE, F-A-C-E, FACE, and they did a workshop, a live surgical workshop every year from 1996-98 to 2000. Even today they are conducting one. And I had an opportunity to conduct one such workshop in 2005 at Anamlai where we did 26 cases all three days. Mani was one of the faculty members and a lot of other members were there. So these were uh, teachers of orthognathic surgery. And I'm going to speak uh, uh, my experience and a little of share my experience on orthognathic surgery in, uh, in present days, what we do as maxillofacial surgeons uh, and uh, what are the role of maxillofacial surgeons and other in contest uh, in correction of dentofacial deformities. What Manikendan was talking is little severe deformities and more a congenital deformity. What I am going to talk orthognathic surgery is for a mild to moderate dentofacial deformities where it can be a dental related deformity or a base related or a skeletal base related deformity. So we need to understand first where the deformity arises from. If it is a dental deformity, means canine to canine, there is a proclination, there is a crowding, there is uh, some vertical excess. So if it is a dental deformity, it can easily be managed by an orthodontist or it can be managed by a non-surgical method. If it is a skeletal deformity where the skeletal base is involved in the excessive growth or an undergrowth, then it needs a surgical correction. So the first point where we need to understand is the deformity, about the deformity, whether the deformity is a dental based deformity, a dental deformity or a skeletal deformity. This is the first thing which we need to understand. The second thing is the deformity can be because of excessive growth if it is a skeletal. It can be because of undergrowth in all three dimensions. You have three dimensions, vertical dimensions, anterior posterior dimensions and a transverse dimension. So in all three dimensions, it can be a combination of excess or deficient or both. It can be excess in maxilla, deficient in mandible, it can be deficient in both. So things like that can happen. So you need to understand the point is the basal bone or the skeletal base is excess or deficient in all three dimensions, whether vertically excess or deficient or anterior posteriorly or in a transverse di dimensions. So this is the uh, 
this is the vertical uh, vertical dimension this is the anterior posterior dimension and this is the transverse direct if you see a collapsed mandible maxillary arch then it is transversely deficient if you see a gummy spine then it is vertically excess if you see a see a projection of upper anterior it is a bimaxillary protrusion or anterior posterior excess of maxilla or mandible or both so this is in the vertical direction you need to understand this is an anterior posterior dimension and this is the transverse uh, dimension of the uh, or maxilla so it can be uh, related uh, complication or occlusal related deformity should also be understood well before going in for any type of treatment orthodontic treatment or it is a surgical based treatment whether the patient has got a deep bite or it has got a open bite where the upper and lower does not joined together there is no intercuspation in the anterior region and it is a cross bite a scissors bite not no, rather it is not normal it is a uh, low it comes anterior to the there we call it as a scissors bite or a cross bite so we need to analyze three dimensions changes and we need to analyze the bite in relation to these dimensions also as deep bite open bite or cross bite so there can be secondary deformities there can be secondary deformities also so this is because primarily there is a problem with the growth for example as uh, manik and elsa told in tmd ankylosis the primary problem is ankylosis of temporomandibular joint where the condyle fuses with the glenoid fossa the secondary defect is because the condyle is one of the growth centers of the mandible the mandible fails to grow so there is a secondary deformity of the mandible so the uh, the primary deformity dentofacial deformity differs from the secondary dentofacial deformities the secondary deformity is usually addressed only after correction of the primary pathology or problem if there is an hyperplasia of the condyle the condyle may overgrow because of that there, there can be a facial asymmetry without addressing the condyle where the primary growth center is a problem you if you correct the ortho orthognathically correct the deformity alone it does not solve the purpose so we need to identify that i identify and understand that the secondary deformities due to a primary pathology or a primary cause is also comes under this facial deformities and these are special deformities where you need to address the primary first and then secondary or you can simultaneously address the primary defect and the secondary deformity secondary to the primary problem also so these are the some of the uh, genial deformities in uh, uh, retrognathia progenia and things like that facial asymmetry as i told you in condylar hyperplasia cleft hypomaxilla hypomaxilla or hypoplastic maxilla nasal deformity and syndromic patients where there is lot of other secondary de growth de defects and deformities present so these are the uh, easily analyzed we can easily as we see the patient we can e easily analyze that the patient has got a prognathic upper anterior and uh, you can also see some amount of excess in the maxilla so easily you can identify by uh, clinical examination the clinical examination to analyze the deformity is very very important than any other technological advances what we used to do the diagnostic and treatment planning present days because the clinical uh, ideas alone gives us lot of information to do the correct procedure rather going in by the technological uh, availabilities so these are the things what we need to look up the lip competency the length of the lip the nasolabial angle the chin neck angle the uh, the excess of the, as you all know that the face is divided into one third the upper one third the middle one third and lower one third all three thirds should be equal in dimension if there is the excess of middle one third it means maxilla is vertically excess if there is a lower one third excess it means that mandible vertical height is excess so we need to identify all those things before going into for uh, and you can divide the facial structures into five vertical lines also for five compartments and you can uh, each each compartment should be equal from the uh, pre auricular area to outer canthus outer canthus to inner canthus inner canthus to opposite side so if there is anything uh, abnormal or increase in length shows that that the ala basis why then you have a hypertelorism or you have a a telecanthus so when it is because post traumatic you call it as telecanthus when it is congenital you call it as hypertelorism as uh, one of the cases of mani gand and as so all these things should be uh, assessed clinically just putting three lines horizontally and five lines vertically what is the facial deformity and where does the problem lies that's a simple method of identifying the deformity whether it is vertical or whether it is anterior posterior or it is transverse in dimension
So this is the transverse uh, deficiency of the maxilla. You can see the entire maxillary arch collapsed a V-shaped arch instead of a U-shaped uh, regular arch. So this is this uh, uh, this can also be confirmed with a lot of accessories and other advanced uh, investigations. Like uh, you can take a radiograph, you can take a cephalometrix, and uh, cephalometrics is nowadays. Um, digitalized and uh, you need not take a, a cephalometric x-ray, trace it out and find out what are the abnormalities. You just have a lot of softwares for it and if you can input the, uh, take an x-ray uh, into the, the computer, the computer will analyze what is excess, what is deficient in what dimension it is, whether it is vertically excess or horizontally excess, everything can be, uh, you can get the inferences from the uh, uh, software available. There are a lot of softwares available to do the uh, uh, cephalometrics and to understand the deformity actually. And uh, the third one is a three-dimensional analysis and uh, mock stimulative procedures, what you should do before the attempting to do an orthognathic surgery because where unless and otherwise you transfer the occlusion into a handy model and then you see, open it and see the inner surface of the occlusion, the interdigitation and other things and you can also cut down where you want to cut in the uh, mandible, as, as you want to cut it in the mandible, you can cut it in the, in the, uh, this thing also, model also and you need to uh, do a stimulative procedure before you go in to do it in the operation theater, operation room. And especially when you articulate these models into, into, in, in, in the occlusion, you need to transfer the exact position of the temporomandibular joint and that is why you need to use a face bow and you need to uh, uh, anatomical, use an anatomical articulator for uh, articulation and to analyze, analyze the occlusions and the uh, mock surgeries and things like that. So nowadays you uh, ask uh, one of my uh, well, do, during discussions, the cardiology surgeons here from PIMS are also talking about the advances about in dentistry, rapid prototype modeling and uh, the CAT CAM modeling has come out in excellent uh, uh, thing in, in the treatment of the many dental procedures. So is uh, in our orthognathic procedure also, you can mill the model, exactly the custom made model of the patient and the same deformity can be analyzed in your hand with the resin model. You can do any amount of osteotomy, cut the surgery, you can see the where is the anatomical landmarks like maxillary sinus, like mandibular artery, uh, mandibular canal and all those things you can see and then you can do it and these, these are called as rapid prototype model or stereolithographic model. So only thing is you, the, the, the CD data, the, the whatever uh, uh, CT data should be given to the miller and the company makes you a model for you and the model you can have the exact custom made mandible of a patient which you are going to operate the next day and you can see what all structures you want to see in the model and then you can plan your surgery accordingly. You can also do the same thing in the computer screen that is a which virtual planning and this is also come up in a big way which gives you an exact simulation of what you're going to do next day and how you can avoid complications and where you need to put the plate. You want to put a plate, you can bend the plate accordingly in the resin mandible and keep it ready for you in the next day theater so that you will not waste much of time in bending the plate and uh, complicating the surgical procedures. So the, these are the <coughs> surgical considerations you need to, before you do uh, orthognathic surgery onto a patient with dentofacial deformity, you understand what the patient was. There are histories where the patient jumped from the first floor saying that my pre-operative phase is better than the post-operative phase. There are a lot of cases which has been uh, settled outside the court for making a small surgery where the patient is not willing to have that phase because the phase, uh, patient says that I'm better looking than in my older phase, not in a new phase. Patient need to understand what is that absolutely necessary and you need to explain and counsel the patient to, the, to, to, to their level so that they understand what you're going to do, do is absolutely necessary for the function and aesthetics of the patient. Without that, if you say you don't understand all those things, I'm going to do a mandibular advancement and maxillary setback, the patient might not to be convinced with your surgery post-operatively. Even, even I had in my personal experience one of my private cases, after operating on her, she comes back and says, my, my, my uncle left me and went by, I don't want this face, I want the old face back again. And we, we used to sit down with her every day to two hours talk with her and then convince her that what has been done is right and she is looking better than what she was looking earlier. So they will confuse a lot of other family issues and other issues along with this 
So you need to counsel the patient, make psychologically prepare the patient for the surgery, and then explain about the complications and little relapse and other, other uh, associated uh, disadvantages of these procedures along with the advantages of the procedure and make them convince and accept your treatment. That is very, very important in orthognathic surgery. Three important things we, I, as a teacher, I usually say with orthognathic surgery. One is all the surgeries are done in under general anesthesia. All these procedures are hospital-based procedure. It is not a dental clinic-based procedure. We need an admission of one to three days minimum, depending on the type of procedures. You can do it in daycare if it is a smaller procedure, or two to three days in an hospital care. So in all those cases, when you do an osteotomy in the bone, you need little blood less field. Only then you can precisely do the osteotomy and do the repositioning and do the fixation, whatever necessary. So you need to have an, a bloodless operating field for which you need to ask your anesthetist or recommend your anesthetist to go in for an hypotensive anesthesia. This hypotensive anesthesia keeps the BP down during the procedures and always uh, gives a better operating field for the surgeons to do and the surgeon can finish, it, finish the procedure in an earlier time when he has got a bloodless field. So hypotensive anesthesia is the first one. The second one is the patient can be ac made accepted to give an autogenous bone uh, blood trans uh, tra uh, transfer because when the patient is taken up for surgery, you might have bigger bone loss, bigger blood loss because of the osteotomies in the L4-1 or 2 level or in the mandibular level. So you need to give a blood transfusion for those patients. Because these patients are elective patients, you need not take an, uh, 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 other, other person's bo blood from the blood bank. You can take the blood previous two weeks, three weeks before the surgery from the same patient and store the blood because all these patients are normal patients with good adequate hemoglobin level and you can store the patient and the stored autologous blood can be transfused or used for blood transfusion during the surgical procedure. So first one is hypotensive, be prepared to give an hypotensive anesthesia. Second one is you need to uh, take care of the blood loss and you need to prepare autologous blood if necessary and you can think of doing an autologous blood transfusion for this patients and especially when you do a osteotomy cut basic principles like don't cut the root pipex give a adequate margin from the root so that the blood supply to the root is not damaged make sure you don't fiddle with a lot of anatomical structures into in the procedure and keep away from the anatomical uh, structures all these are the basic principles of doing an orthognathic surgery so these let us go into our cases uh, from a simple uh, surgery like there are surgeries which assist an orthodontist to perform an orthodontic tooth movement. That is called as pre-orthodontic surgery or surgical assisted orthodontics. Before the patient takes the patient for orthodontic, orthodontic procedure because of thick bone, because of interradicular thick uh, bone, bone areas, you need some amount of weakening to be done in that area so that the orthodontic tooth movement will be faster. So this is one of the procedures what we call it as corticotomy where in case, especially in case of uh, 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 spacing in between the teeth, what you can do is you can make a osteotomy cut here, only one cortex, make the interradicular bone weaker, then do a fixed appliance, the tooth moves faster and earlier than the normal orthodontic tooth movement. So this is called as orthodontic corticotomy. Be you call it as corticotomy because you are making a groove or weakening one only one cortex of the bone, that is why you call it as a corticotomy. One cortex alone is cut. You can also do a single tooth osteotomy or you can do an osteotomy around the tooth and distalize the canine. This is called as vilcodontics or distalization of canine, canine distalization. For example, for this canine to move in an extracted premolar area, it will take about eight months to nine months for an orthodontist for distalizing the canine completely. When you want to think of doing it faster because of some reasons, you can do the extractions of premolar and then put a distraction, a tooth bond distraction appliances so that every one day you can have one millimeter of distalization of the canine. You can push the canine slowly to the extracted socket of premolar here and this is called as canine distalization. This can also be, this is little crude uh, uh, intraoral distractor. There are modified uh, uh, costlier distractors which can be used for canine distra distraction. This is a tooth bond distractor. As he was talking about a bone bond distractors, you can fix these uh, components into the tooth itself like one component, one component into the anterior teeth uh, in, the pre uh, in the canine region and one in the prima uh, first molar region. And this is the activating arm when, uh, when you turn each and one turn, 
one millimeter of movement of canine will go distally after extraction of this premolar. This is maxilla and this is mandible. So this is a tooth bond uh, apparatus where you can fix uh, like a like a molar band. You can fix it around the tooth and attach a distractor into it so that you can use this for distalizing the canine apparatus. And you can see the canine totally distalized within seven days of time. Instead of seven months, you can distalize seven millimeters or five millimeters of canine within seven days by means of distraction. And immediately you can start doing an orthodontic treatment. And this is one of the advantages, especially when you want to do an earlier, earlier orthodontic uh, treatment earlier or in a shorter time, or if it needs because of certain reasons, and you can do a canine distalization, mo both maxilla and mandible with the distraction bone appliance. This is a surgical assisted orthodontics. Similarly, you can also do a maxillary, you know, when there is a collapsed max transverse maxillary arch, you can expand the maxillary arch by means of Firax screw or a, 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 by, by means of uh, maxillary expanders. And these uh, expansion screws can be uh, used after doing a Lefort one type of osteotomy, not osteotomy, completely disjunctioning. You make a cut alone, you make sure you separate the basal bone from the alveolar bone, and then you don't down fracture it, you don't break it. Automatically, you put an apparatus in the palate and you just activate the palatal apparatus. It can distract the uh, maxilla on the transverse dimension. So this is also called as uh, uh, surgical assisted maxillary expansion or surgical assisted rapid palatal expansion. So this can also be done. Only thing is, this can also be given without doing a surgery also. little bit It acts a little bit slower. But if you do this Lefort 1 osteotomy cut alone, complete the Lefort 1 osteotomy with the midline osteotomy, you make the two maxillary segments separately without any fracturing, then put a distractor. It, it will not have any hurdles of bone or any prevention of bone to move. It will easily move to the sides and it can have a early or a speedy a maxillary expansion is possible. So this is one of the, these are the procedures which a surgeon, surgeon can do it before an orthodontic treatment to uh, fasten the orthodontic timing and uh, for a better result. The second one is the surgery per se, whether it should be done after the uh, orthodontic treatment because when you want to change the jaw position from a present occlusion into a newer occlusion, it will be very, very difficult unless otherwise the orthodontic prepare the dental structures according to the planned bone movement. Unless otherwise you, you plan the movement, this is what eight millimeters I'm going to take back. There should be some eight millimeters, the differences between the uh, upper anteriors and lower anteriors so that even if it is taken back, it does not interfere the occlusion. So the always the orthodontist should plan and move the necessary tooth to tooth movements uh, for the planned surgery. That is called as pre-surgical orthodontics. Before surgery, you do, usually what we do is we do a decompensation. For example, when, whenever there is a mandibular prognathism, basal bone is increased in length, the teeth will tend to follow the upper, upper anteriors and it will go in for a normal compensatory mechanism. In these cases, you can't take the mandible with this position back by four millimeters because the tooth will not be aligned properly to the basal bone. You need to decompensate or exaggerate the present occlusion in a reverse manner, then take the mandible backward. That is called as decompensation of the dental structures. So this decompensation is a pre-surgical orthodontics, what everybody do it, and uh, we need to do before doing a, a, either a, any form of surgeries in the maxilla. So we have a segmental osteotomy or a total maxillary osteotomy or a segmental mandibular osteotomy or a total mandibular osteotomy where you can segmentally from canine, canine to canine, you can cut the anterior maxilla alone, do any type of movement posteriorly, anteriorly, superiorly, inferiorly, whatever type of movement you want to do, you can do it. Or you need to cut the entire maxilla down, fracture it, and uh, you, you can do a subapical osteotomy, what you call it as, why it is called a subapical? Because it is below the apex of the lower anteriors. You can make an osteotomy in the bone, and after extraction of premolar or without extraction of premolar, and you can just move the tooth. This is one of uh, uh, my segmental osteotomy cases, preoperative and the postoperative. You can see a good lip, lip positioning, and the vertical axis, which is shown showing the upper anteriors, is has uh, been corrected properly. So these are the uh, maxillary segmental osteotomy, especially segmental osteotomies can also be done for aphthognathia, for an anterior open bite. When the upper anteriors and lower anteriors, because of increased overjet and overbite, if there is no 
proper interdigitation we can do on subepical osteotomy, take a small bone from the genium itself and transfer in, into this place which is, which is by which you can push this uh, subepical region little upwards correcting the anterior open bite. This is called as Cole's procedure which can be followed by whenever there is a, 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 a open bite like this. So there is an open bite, anterior open bite, this is corrected anterior open bite without any orthodontic treatment. We'll say that if you do it along with an orthodontic treatment, the results will be better. And this is the Coles procedure where the subepical osteotomy was performed. The small bone from the genium itself is taken and interposed between the subepical osteotomy. And this is a pre and post operative occlusion, anterior open bite. So you can see the molars are in occlusion, but anteriors are not in, uh, in occlusion. So anterior open bite corrected by means of this uh, Coles procedure. So uh, that is another case. The routine Lifford one uh, needs to expose the entire maxilla uh, fr from the nasal floor. This is the nasal floor and uh, this is the anterior wall of the maxilla. To the posterior lateral wall of the maxilla, you need to expose. You need to detach all the attachment from the cranial base. See, this is one of the attachments, the septum. The septum should be cut, severed, disjunction. The lateral wall, uh, the lateral wall of the nose should be cut and then the anterior maxillary wall should be cut, the posterior lateral wall should be cut, the pterygoid plate should be disjunctioned, only then the entire maxilla will float and that maxilla can be moved in any direction and repositioned to a newer, a newer, I'll show you the video, this is the nasal floor retraction, this is the uh, anterior maxillary uh, bony cut which uh, runs downwards and uh, backwards and it, it, it should uh, come near the pterygoid plates and the pterygoid uh, things also should be disjunctions. We can also have some modified uh, uh, cuts like this so that it, uh, the relapse rate is less when, when you especially advance the mandible when you want to put a bone graft, you can put a mo modified cuts like this. So this is the uh, pterygoid disjunctioning which is a very important step in a Lefort 1 osteotomy which m many people think it's very difficult but there are situations we need not even fracture the pterygoid, the mandible can be down fractured. There are literatures to prove that and we are, we are, by the experience the surgeon can feel that even without much disturbing the pterygoid plates, the maxilla can be moved downwards. So this is the maxillary osteotomy. You can see the from the nasal floor, floor elevated, the septum chiseled, the lateral wall, uh, lateral nasal wall cut and the osteotomy taken down to the posterior region and the entire maxilla is mobile which can be mobilized in any direction freely from the basal bone and then it can be plated using a plate or two plates or four plates or whatever it is, even wires was used in exteriors. Nowadays we use only plating. So these are the uh, maxillary osteotomies. You can see uh, we can use, need not use a scalpel also, scalpel or a blade to make an incision because Ultimately, we want a very uh, bloodless field, so we can use a diathermy or a electrocartery, what we call this. Most of the surgeons nowadays dissect, make an incision in the subcutaneous layer from the subcutaneous plane. Only thing is they don't use it in the skin. Even oncosurgeons use it in the skin, but others, aesthetic surgeons never use it in the skin. But you need to cut the entire, the muscle, the submucosal layers and go deep to the bone. Once the bone is exposed, you can see no, um, no bleeding at all especially so that it does not uh, interferes with your surgical procedure. That is the nasal spine where we are cutting and it can go deep into the uh, anterior wall of the maxilla, exposing the anterior wall of the maxilla from molar to molar and then you, test, you can start uh, doing a bone cutting. So if, if at all there is any ooze or any uh, bleeding, you can u utilize this, uh, cut the uh, just open up the maxilla so that it is totally detached from the basal bone and it can you can move the maxilla to any direction you can move the maxilla to any direction you can bring it down you can uh, take it up you can do go, go take it to one of the side if there is a midline shift and things like that and you need to detach all the bony attachments so that the maxilla is freely moving here and there. This is the split spreader what I'm using. Whenever you use an osteotomy, you put the split spreader in the osteotomy and then you open it. Uh, these are the results we can get with this uh, maxillary osteotomies. So you can take the entire maxilla up, exposed, the exposed the central incisors will not be seen afterwards. So it is uh, just in a very adequate good smile line. You can produce a adequate good smile line. 
and uh, you can treat the gummy smiles. If even with orthodontics, you can have a perfect alignment of tooth and then the exposure of the central incisors can be uh, corrected. See here, you can more than two thirds of the central incisors are exposed with a resting uh, lip line here. After the osteotomy, you can see a projected chin button with the adequate uh, exposure and not much of more exposure. You can see the chin anterior posteriorly. I've done a genioplasty, advancement genioplasty, and the, the vertical facial height is also reduced here. You can uh, see the reduction of the maxillary height. So these are some of the cases we uh, pre and post operative x-ray. You can see the projection of anteriors, vertical maxillary excess, which has been corrected by Lefort 1 and an advancement genioplasty. Uh, always when you do a genioplasty, cutting the genium alone and bringing it anteriorly will give a better facial aesthetics. These are the osteotomies in the genium. And uh, this is one, another case uh, with the vertical maxillary axis, uh, excess, and you can see the pre and post operative with a good lip position. So entire exposure of the central incisors uh, to the canine to canine will be uh, having a gummy smile will be corrected by this Lefort one procedure or a maxillary two piece procedure. You can either cut it as one piece or you can cut it as two piece an anterior segment that can also be separated from the entire maxilla and you can uh, adjust this anterior posteriorly whenever there is a vertical excess and an anterior posterior excess. So both can be addressed in the same procedure. This is another case. You can well appreciate the position of the central incisors, exposure of the gum. Here in the rest position you can see uh, a, a normal uh, face after the osteotomy. You can also do the posterior maxillary osteotomy for correction of anterior uh, open bite. Instead of doing it in the anterior region, you can cut the posterior alone and take it up so that the mandible overcloses and the uh, thing is corrected, anterior maxillary. Mandibular procedures, as I told you, it, it's got a, this is a hypoplastic maxilla where uh, uh, Mani has showed you about the blue distractors and red distractors. It's an extraoral distractors because osteotomy plays a very minor role. Whatever we do osteotomy in the maxilla because of scar tissue, it relapses. So we need to go in for a, a advanced uh, distraction techniques where in which an external distractor is put and the maxilla is brought forward. So mandibular procedures, the standard procedure is sagittal split osteotomy in the mandible, but which is, uh, is time-tested and uh, everybody can do it. But the only complication is uh, you should handle the nerve very carefully. It's technique sensitive, it's highly technique sensitive. Only thing, and you need to know the technique properly. Uh, only then you can do the separation without any problem. So you can go in for uh, any type of osteotomies in the body in the anterior mandible, in the posterior mandible, in the ramus of the mandible. So any type of osteotomies, many type of osteotomies has, are performed in the subcondylar level, in the subsigmoid level, in an inverted L osteotomy. Now all thing, any osteotomy, it can, you can do it to forward the mandible, bring the mandible forward, or you to set back the mandible with the same osteotomy. So this is the ramus osteotomy, this is the vertical subsigmoid osteotomy, this is the reverse tail osteotomy, this is subcondylar osteotomy, all these osteotomies, this is a classical sagittal split osteotomy where you sagittally split the mandible at the ramus level and then you can advance the mandible or set back the mandible. So in, in case of uh, anterior open bite, you can also do a sagittal uh, C-shaped osteotomy in the ramus of the mandible. In case of uh, uh, severe uh, mandibular prognathism, you can do a vertical subsigmoid osteotomy where you can move the mandible more than 9 millimeters and 10 millimeters. So this is the classical sagittal split osteotomy where the mandible uh, ramus and the body of the mandible slides together in the anterior position sagittally and uh, you can fix it with by means of uh, screws or uh, plates or whatever you are trained under. I, I've been uh, to Antwerp University, Belgium and uh, that gentleman there, the surgeon now operates only with two, three screws and he fixes the sagittally advanced sagittal mandible with three screws. He does eight cases in one day. 20, 25 minutes for a sagittal split osteotomy, where we routinely do take one and a half hours to do a sagittal split osteotomy. So as you master the technique more and more, the te uh, technique is very simple, and you can be convenient with putting a plate. Uh, instead of putting a plate, you can put to screw fixation to avoid a lot of uh, metal uh, into the uh, operated site. So that is about sagittal split osteotomy. This is the bony cut. This is where... Uh, now, all is the video. I don't want to waste uh, much of time by playing the video. This is the sagittally cut from the lingual aspect to the labial aspect. You cut the labial cortex, one cortex alone, 
you take the osteotomy obliquely to the lingual aspect of the mandible and uh, to the medial aspect of the mandible above the mandibular foramen you make a groove so that the, that is the that is the weakest zone posterior to the mandibular canal and it fractures in the mandibular canal and it sagittally splits the mandible into two halves by, by which you can advance the mandible or you can set back the mandible. If you want to set back the mandible, you make two cuts, remove the interim bone, push the mandible back so that the mandible goes back. So these are some of the uh, cases. I'll show you some of the cases. This is the plating which is done after the uh, setting back or advancing of the mandible. This is set back because there is no space in between. If there is a space in between, then you, you, you should say it is an advancement of the mandible. So it is a setback of the mandible. The mandible goes beyond. The, we are here we have not decompensated the, you can see the teeth all tilting inwards because this is one of the surgical first case. I will come to that later. This, this is the class three mandible. What you, what you say is class three mandible. There is the projection of mandibular mandible over the maxillary uh, dimensions and you have a prognathism of the mandible. See, this is the immediate post-operative. You can, you can do a combination of maxillary and mandibular procedures also because taking the mandible alone to 10 millimeters back may compromise the airway, may compromise the tongue position. So you can also slightly advance the maxilla and then take the mandible simultaneously. So seven millimeters of mandibular setback and four, five millimeters of maxillary advancement will compensate the entire uh, aesthetic and functional uh, of the patient. So this is immediate post-operative and you can see the occlusion also. This patient want only surgery to correct because he, uh, he does not want, uh, he does not have any time to go in for orthodontic, in orthodontics in spite of upstanding canines, we took him for surgical first technique, means we do the surgery first and then do orthodontics so that the uh, dental correction is delayed and uh, the surgery is done first so that the entire uh, skeletal deformity is masked by the surgery, then the dental occlusion is corrected by orthodontics. So you can see the uh, class three occlusion changed into a normal occlusion. And here again in the X-ray, you can appreciate this amount of over reverse overjet is corrected with the maxillary advancement and the mandibular setback. This is a sagittal split osteotomy done and the plating done here. So these are some of the cases with mandibular lengthening, vertical excess of the mandible with anterior open bite corrected and uh, this is some of my old, old cases. And you can also do an extra oral procedure by a, called a subsigmoid osteotomy. You can make a small submandibular incision, go to the subsigmoid ridge, posterior to the mandibular canal and mandibular uh, foramen, you can make an osteotomy like this and it, 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 it is called a vertical subsigmoid osteotomy. <coughs> this is inverted L osteotomy. So genioplasty is also a uh, very, very uh, important procedure. As a beginner, each and every oral surgeon can do a genioplasty procedure where it gives an additional uh, aesthetics for any type of osteotomy you perform. Whenever there is a vertical excess, if you see a flat chin, you advance the chin. Even if it is not going to serve the purpose, it is going to add up to the aesthetics. And especially in facial asymmetries like uh, uh, condylar hyperplasia, condylar hyperplasia, ankylosis of temporomandibular joint in which the chin is also uh, shifted to one side. See here, if you put a midline, the chin is shifted to this side. Here it is corrected. So you can do a double sliding genioplasty. You can put two cuts in the chin itself and you can advance it because once if you put only one cut, it can, you can advance the chin only by four to five millimeters. If you cut two cuts, it is like a step. You can do four plus four, eight millimeters of advancement. So only more of advancement you need in the chin, you can go in for a step later or uh, you can well appreciate the chin angle. You can see the flattened chin here. The lip and chin angle is missing. The chin and the neck angle is missing. Here you can see uh, everything is uh, restored normally by, by a double chin uh, uh, osteotomy. So that is about, uh, these are the post uh, ankylotic surgery. I told you secondary deformities are in the chin, uh, asymmetry in the chin. So when you do an ankylosis procedure itself, you can do a chin uh, correction so that it will correct the facial asymmetry of the chin. These are some of the, of our ankylosis cases with uh, extended sliding genioplasty. Wherever it is shifted, you shift the chin alone in an extended level to the ankylotic side so that the facial asymmetry is uh, uh, corrected properly. So surgery first is the recent trend. These are, these are the last few slides. Surgery first is the recent trend. 
before doing an orthodontics for two years, then convincing the patient for surgery, give him an immediate improvement in the facial aesthetics first by surgery, compromise the occlusion, compromise the function for some time, then correct the occlusion by orthodontics for another one year. That is the recent trend. And once if you do the surgery first, the aesthetic is what seen outside. The patient is very happy, even with a little compromised function. Once the orthodontics takes care of the com uh, uh, occlusion and uh, functions, then it will be always. So surgery first, this is the pre-operative and post-operative. You can see the mandible corrected. All this is uh, uh, my surgery first procedure, sagittal split and Lefort one osteotomy for him. This is another girl from Bangalore with the anterior open bite. We did only a chin procedure and a subapical procedure. We didn't even do a Lefort one procedure. The, pro the prominence of the, uh, she had a very psychological background, so we don't want to do more of the surgical procedures. A little surgical procedure which can improve the chin. Chin C, uh, the, she has got a very flat chin here, and you can see a beautifully elevated chin and forwarded chin, which gives a good aesthetic appearance. So a subapical osteotomy and an advancement chin with anterior segmental can be a, a standard procedure for the beginners when you do it in the anterior mandible and the maxilla. And uh, chin alone can, can give you a lot of good results. These are some of my uh, immediate surgery before orthodontics. So you can see the, the, uh, the appliance has been done, but it's not activated. Only after the surgery, the patient will go in for an orthodontic treatment. So we plan accordingly a chin and a Lefort one osteotomy. You can see the OZ corrected here, the vertical dimensions of the maxilla corrected here, shortened here, fixed with a plate, and the advancement genoplasty done. Here again, the mandible prognathus, uh, mandible was brought forward, mandible uh, class two bite, and uh, the mandible was brought forward with chin. You can see the advancement of the mandible here by a sagittal split osteotomy. These are the um, uh, surgical procedures, what we can do in the basal bone, that is the bandible or maxilla to correct the dentofacial deformity. This is pre and post operative. Uh, he is again an engineer uh, from Bangalore. We have done a Lefort one um, a superior repositioning with the uh, uh, sagittal split osteotomy and uh, a genioplasty. You can see the uh, occlusion preoperatively, you can see the occlusion postoperatively. You can appreciate the mandible taken back by about eight to nine millimeters. So there are a lot of actuant procedure also. Not only moving the hard tissue is very important, you should adjust the soft tissues also. But for example, if you take the maxilla superiorly, what will unintentionally, un un what will you do is you will flare up the nasal base. So you will have a, a LR base widening. So you need to control by doing a suture there in the LR base. That is called as a cinch suture. If, if necessary, you can put some augmentation material, something like this is one of the hemifacial microstomia case. Patient was getting ready for a marriage, so she wants something to correct. Occlusion was normal. A mandible was not deformed. Only thing is the muscle part of it was weakened or uh, deficient on this side. So what we did is we did a metaphor augmentation with the amount of free fat, free fat uh, dermis grafting. So we put some fat there. We put some the metaphor. Uh, uh, alloplastic material there which is bio compatible and uh, we are fixed at the angle of the mandible and this is the post operative you can see the screw holding the metaphor into the angle of the mandible so uh, there are a lot of complications associated with the uh, not much to worry because that is only you should call only as a stipulate of the surgical procedure not as a complication so uh, not very big endangering complications is orthognathic surgery. So whenever patient comes to you for any skeletal deformities, don't hesitate to suggest a surgical procedure, rather camouflaging it by an orthodontic, pro orthodontic procedure. Because it's easy to do an orthodontic camouflage, but you are not scientifically doing it right, and there will be a lot of problems afterwards. There will be relapse, and there will be a lot of problems. So initially, when you see that, when you identify that it's only skeletal, and uh, don't worry, uh, send the patient or get an uh, oral surgeon's opinion to go in for a surgical correction of the skeletal deformity. These are some of other deformities in soft tissue uh, maxillary. This is one of the mesitric hyperplasia where you have, because of excessive clenching, you have a mesitric hypertrophy. Even these patients will come with a temporomandibular joint problem also. 
So what you need to do is identify the muscle. You just remove the part of the excessive hyperplastic muscle alone, muscitric muscle alone. And because of hyperextension of the muscle, you will have little overgrown angle of the mandible here. You need to cut the angle and give a small chin advancement so that aesthetically is better. So this is muscitric hypertrophy, uh, hyperplasia, where you have an excessive muscitric muscle. Here the muscitric muscles have been corrected. Here the mandible itself is elongated. You can see one of half of the mandible is elongated here. Uh, this patient is was from Trichy, and uh, she came just before the marriage to get it corrected. And uh, what we did is we did an extra oral approach. We can also do it intra orally. I was not very sure about intra oral because I thought the mandibular nerve will come in between, and we need to skeletonize the mandibular nerve. We need to remove the mandibular mandibular nerve from the mandibular bone, and then leave it in the soft tissue. Then do the osteotomy. That is why we did it extra orally. And uh, uh, this is the, uh, the, the bowed of mandible, lower border of the mandible here. And this is the mandibular nerve. I have just exposed the outer cortex of the mandibular canal. I removed the nerve, not removed the nerve. I have uh, relocated re, uh, the mandibular nerve from here, from the canal to the soft tissue, then made an osteotomy below the mandibular so that I am not disturbing the blood supply, nerve supply to the teeth. I am maintaining the nerve supply to the teeth. That is why we did it extra orally. This is usually done in cases of implant procedures where they relocate the nerve and then put an implant. Eh? So this is one of the standard procedure and this is the amount of bone we have removed from the lower border without disturbing the mandibular canal. And uh, this is the pre and post operative. You can see a, a, a fairly good amount of symmetry has been achieved when compared to this bowing of the mandible or lengthened mandible. So this is again a similar case with the same type of uh, relocation of the mandibular nerve done and the lower border osteotomy done and lower border, uh, see you can see the nerve is not uh, involved in the osteotomy. I have made a osteotomy in the lower border of the mandible, remove the excess grown bone and this is immediate postoperative with the facial symmetry. Uh, near normal, this is only a postoperative edema and uh, near normal facial symmetry and you, that is well appreciated in an x-ray. You can see bowing of the lower border in the preoperative x-ray where you have got the normal like opposite side in the postoperative x-ray. So this is again a condylar hyperplasia. You can see the condyle is overgrown here. Because of that, there is an elongation of mandible. Here you can't do only the mandible. In those ca two cases, you have only mandibular elongation, not a condylar hyperplasia. Here there is a mandibular elongation because of condylar hyperplasia. So you need to do a condylar uh, resection, that, uh, remove the excess part of the condylar growth, and then do the lower border osteotomy alone. So this is uh, the, the excessive growth in the mandible on one side. Because of condylar hyperplasia, we opened the condyle, removed the part of the condyle and the lower border also. And this is the lower border reshaping done and the condyle removed with the same incision. And you can see the hyperplastic condyle removed and the mandible bowing is corrected near normal to the opposite side. So this is the pre and post operative picture of the patient. You can appreciate the uh, facial asymmetry corrected by the, uh, the osteotomy what we have done. This is again a severe case of Prusansky. Here you can't see one condyle, one coronoid, one ramus itself, unit itself is absent. It's a very critical case. <coughs> Sorry. It's a very difficult case also to manage because we need to reconstruct the entire ramus, the entire condyle. So what we did is we wanted to do by stages. We have done two stage procedures. First stage procedure, we wanted to correct the occlusal cant. You can see the cant of the occlusion. You can see the occlusion is shifted to one side like this. So we uh, differential osteotomy in the maxilla. We plan to do a Lefort one a differential osteotomy in the maxilla, where here I will be removing more amount of uh, more amount of bone because the ca occlusal cant was like this. When a scale was kept preoperatively, you would have seen the picture. The scale will be in this position. So this side of the maxilla is overgrown, and this side of the maxilla is undergrown. So what we are going to do is we are going to remove a part of the anterior maxillary wall and then we are going to shift the maxilla in two different directions, one more on the right side and less on the left side so that the, the asymmetry is corrected and the intra-operative, intra-table. In the table you put a scale and see the occlusion is normal. We have uh, fixed the Lefort 1 osteotomy by means of plating. We have also done some advancement sliding genioplasty to one side where there is uh, less amount of bone is there. We augmented some iliac bone, free iliac bone grafting in the maxilla. On the uh, deficient side, this is the iliac bone grafting which was harvested. And in the genium side or in the mandible side, we have not touched the ramus of the mandible because we thought after this getting all right, we will put some bone grafting in the ramus of the mandible. 
So without touching the defective area, we have corrected the maxilla first. We have uh, advanced the genium and decided to one side. We have put some bone graft. And these screws are holding the bone graft here and there. And we also put a fat augmentation as a second stage. And uh, this was pre and post operative. You can get, you can appreciate some amount of early morning. Usually there will be some amount of edema. And usually after water rounds, our, our guys take a picture. It little edema is there. And the post operative phase, you can see the fullness of this side, not uh, as flat as originally. So once if you reconstruct the mandible for such patient, he will be happy. So this is my last case, and uh, this uh, this is about uh, 27 years of follow-up we have, and this was first done by our uh, professor, mentor Dr. B. Srinivasan. I was one among the postgraduate trainee among him to do this procedure, and this procedure was first taken up in 1993 for a cruise-ons patient. Uh, as you all know, the cruise-on patients is a cranial stenostosis. All the sutures of the cranium will unite. It will not give away, so the brain will not grow. So one of uh, Dr. Shankar's uncle, Dr. Shankar is there. He was a, a primary surgeon for this case, and uh, uh, he was a pediatric surgeon at Anamalai, and a fantastic surgeon and a very uh, nice gentleman who, who is a very good teacher, we, 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 who taught us 13 hours. That was the first time we were standing inside the theater as uh, uh, even our previous speaker was talking about. We did a bicoronal approach and we skeletonized the uh, entire cranium. The, wherever the cranium was fused, we broke the cranium and then we interposed some amount. This is the cranium. We have taken out the outer cranial vault, the supraorbital region, the frontal bone. All this was being taken out. This is a raw, raw brain which is protected by means of gauze and some medications. And these are the cranium which was, uh, cranium which was taken out and we realigned, realigned it and then positioned it back again. This is cranioplasty. Nowadays they do by distraction, they do a lot of plating and mesh works there. But those days we had more of wires to stabilize it. So in between the nose, we put one bone graft here, rib graft and then wired it. And wherever there is space, we want some space to happen. We have expanded the cranial vault so that the brain has got some space to move, so the milestones are normal, the patient has not got irritability, the patient is not got, uh, getting the pro proptosis, or eye will come out when the brain is not allowed to grow because of the pressure in the cranium. So all this has been corrected, and you can see, appreciate that uh, there is a little amount of space which is created so that the brain grows. Once if it starts growing, then it will not reunite. It, will, it, it is like distraction. As the soft tissue pushes, the bone also pushes. So that is what happened with this baby. And uh, 2001, the patient came to me, was referred again to me for his hypoplastic maxilla. This, this is the, you can see the earlier uh, incision here. And this patient was having an hypoplastic maxilla. The mother, and, uh, they are from Kadalur. They came to me for a maxillary advancement procedure. We did a, a quadrangle osteotomy and a maxillary advancement procedure. Though it is earlier, we thought it will help him in his growth. So that we did a maxillary advancement with the amount of bone grafting in the uh, neso maxillary area because neso maxillary hypoplasia was there for him. And 2013, he came as a doctor. He's an MBBS uh, graduated fellow. Uh, in one of the uh, colleges near Pondicherry. And this gentleman came to us for some other dental corrections and we did a, a, a anterior open bite alone was there. And we did a sub uh, Colts procedure or a uh, subapical osteotomy with the genium. Since uh, uh, subapical osteotomy was done and the genium was used to graft that area, I didn't do a sagittal split osteotomy. I thought that itself is enough and we dentally rehabilitated the patient. The patient was happy and he is doing his postgraduate medical degree. So the journey of Cruzon from 1993 to 2005 is so. There are a lot of other osteotomy procedures which a oral surgeon or a maxillofacial surgeon can perform to correct the dentofacial deformity. Only thing which is dread or only thing which is not happening is referral from our dentist and colleagues. The first thing what as an undergraduate student you should know is identify these dentofacial deformities correctly if it is a skeletal one, refer it to an oral surgeon or request your oral surgeon to come and do the procedure for you. But even today, we can't do better surgery. This is one of our uh, uh, workers, uh, class three workers in our hospital who is still working with this proptosis and this, she is also a cruzon syndrome. Patient might not have any big functional problems, but some attitudinal difference with all these aesthetic problems. But she was not ready to get the treatment done. And even we, 
in India have not extended to the level of LIFO 3 level or LIFO 2 level osteotomy. We are even in the learning phase today. So nothing is complete. We have a lot of challenges to face and we have a lot of things to be very friendly with and refer the cases to our maxillofacial surgeon. So the surgical options are many available. Adequate planning is absolutely necessary. Whenever adjuvant procedures are necessary, think and advise those adjuvant procedures. Even when you put an implant, when there is one uh, uh, socket uh, loss or a one bone is uh, deficient in one side, don't hesitate to put a bone graft. When you put a bone graft, don't hesitate to put a GTR membrane. Only then the success rate is good. When you don't utilize these bone substitutes or, the, or GTR membranes or adjuvant procedures, when you fail to do it, the success rate is very, very less. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your patient listening. Have a nice day. Hope I've given you some message and some information about osteotomies and uh, uh, dentofacial deformity corrections. There are lots and lots what a maxillofacial surgeon do for dentofacial deformity. And when you identify a clear dentofacial deformities, absolutely surgery is essential along with orthodontics. Without orthodontics, never a dentofacial deformity can be corrected normally. Thank you. Thank you for your patient listening.